for you. Grab your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus. Moving along, we, last week we had uh, Moses being sent to go talk to Pharaoh, and he was concerned. And as he comes in through, he talks to um, the people. And he talks about in here that Moses uh, really, really dedicated himself to the Lord. And we see this on his way home, if you will, right, as we're heading home. And at the end of it, we had that problem with, with Moses' uh, son not being circumcised. That in here we have a responsibility to do what is right in following the Lord. And oftentimes, some of my problem in my life is I'm doing the, doing the wrong thing, and then I still want God's blessing in my life. You ever been in that case? No, I, I know I'm not in a good place. I know I'm not doing the right thing. And, and still, Lord, I, I want you to bless me. And why isn't this working? Well, because I'm not doing what I know I should do. And I should strive to get myself in line with the Lord and, and have him lead me in that instead of trying to bless my chaos and bless my mistakes. And we see this in the Lord. And, and Moses' wife gets uh, her son circumcised, and they head in. And then when they get down to Egypt, they share with the folks, Moses, imagine the news, right? They've been slaves. They've been in bondage in, Israel, in, in Egypt. And Moses shows up and goes, God has sent me to deliver you. And the Bible says there that they worship they praised the Lord, and they were so ecstatic over what the Lord was doing. And like Moses is often, uh, you ever feel like your life is on a roller coaster? You know, uh, you, you, you give your life to the Lord, and you feel like, you know, everything should be just going great from here on out. Maybe we have a, a victory in our lives. We see God answers a prayer. Uh, he, he intervenes in something. We see the hand of God, and we're, we're so excited at what God is doing. And then I mess up. All of a sudden now things aren't going so well, and things get tough, and my faith goes, doo -doo 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 -doo, like I'm up on the mountaintop, yay, 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 and then something hard comes, and it's like, no, 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 no. Am I the only one that's that way? With that sort of roller coaster. And Lord, my desire is to be slow and steady. Right? But my faith and my emotions, my Christian life looks probably more like this. Up and down, up and down. And we see this, we're not alone. Actually, as we look at the scripture, so many of the men and women of God follow that same sort of pattern. So we're not alone in this. And so anytime, you know, things are going well, I don't want to jinx it because I don't believe in jinxes, but you know what I mean. You know, you're afraid to say something because, oh, things are going so well. Look how it's doing. You know, look at the church and, and we're seeing new people. We're excited over that. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're tracked down, I was looking at the offerings and the offerings have been good. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, and I'm almost afraid, almost you're afraid to say something, right? Because <laughs> what's going what's to happen? That roller coaster. And a couple things happens in our lives. Sometimes it's just a cycle of life, right? Life is just that way. The Bible says it rains on the just and runs on the unjust, right? We, life is just filled with struggles, and it's normal. You know, you got to be careful because we can fall into this idea of having these rose-colored glasses to people over the years who thought that once I give my life to Christ, everything is going to be great. Actually, when I was in Bible school, there was a gentleman who was uh, teaching, and he was preaching, and we were at the city mission. So we're down with a lot of homeless and a lot of people who are kind of down and out. And, uh, and he came down at the end of it to give an invitation if anyone wanted to accept Christ. And he goes, if anyone here this morning wants to accept Christ, 
come forward and shake my hand. And he goes, by shaking my hand, God will take all your problems away. And he goes, not only that, but you'll walk and you'll be a son and daughter of God, and you won't have a single problem ever again. And I'm in back thinking, that ain't true. And he stepped down, and several people came forward to shake his hand because they wanted that. Right? How many of you think that sounds like a great deal? Never have a problem ever again. Uh, sign me up. I got to be honest with you. That's not life. We live in a broken world. But in here, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I struggle, and you struggle, and we see what takes place, and we live in a world where there's rust out working on vehicles. Right? We live in a world where things fall apart. We live in a world where there's sickness, there's cancer. We live in a world that's that way. And being a Christian does not make us immune from those problems. And I couldn't help but think that when that gentleman gave that invitation and, and laid that out, of how many people said, hey, I want that, and then the next day things didn't work out for them, and they're like, wait a minute, what happened? Be careful of the rose-colored glasses. I mean, there is no such thing as a perfect Christian. Right? Now, we, you know, from the outside looking in, you might think that, oh, man, so-and-so is just such a wonderful, great person. And I've heard that over the years being here. You know, there's some of you that have a great reputation, and, and people will say, oh, that, oh yeah, so-and-so, they're just a, such a perfect person. And I'm sure each one of us would say, well, right, you know, don't put me on that pedestal. Right? You may turn around and say, well, Pastor, you're just so wonderful, and you have the perfect family. Yeah, sure. No. But that expectation of that causes us to be shocked because the Bible wants us to be aware of the struggles we have. And the difference is, as Christians, we have Christ with us in the midst of the storm. In John 16, Jesus says, These things have I spoken to you that... In me, you may have peace. In the world, you'll have what? What's that say? In the world, you'll have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We're in this world, and we're going to have problems. Things aren't always going to be sunshiny and bright. We're going to have issues. Jesus warns us, in this world, we'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have Christ on our side. We're not going through these things alone. We have a God who does answer our prayers, who does hear us. James puts it this way. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This is one of those verses that it's hard to read. Right? Count it all joy in your trials. Does anyone here like trials? Anyone like the hard times? I'm not seeing any hands. Right? I'm not. No one enjoys that. I don't like when things don't work out. I don't like it when I'm sick. I don't like it when I'm discouraged. I don't like it when life is hard. I, I, I want life to be easy. Right? I'm sure I'm not alone. But the Bible says, count it all joy in our trials. That seems more of an oxymoron. But the passage doesn't end here because there's a reason for it. Knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience or endurance. That the hard times in my life have a purpose and have a cause for us. And in here is to produce that endurance. I'm going to pick on Elwin this morning, but he's got his shoulder surgery, and, 
And over the years, I've known some people who had it, so much so that I think more so than any other part when you start getting replaced, um, that you got to have that range of motion, and you got to push it, and you got to move it, and it hurts. But you got to go past that point in order to keep that range of motion. Uh, years ago, we were in a church, and there was two ladies had uh, their soldiers replaced, and one of them, she did her exercises over and above, and and within a few months, she, she, was, she was back doing everything else and fought, swatting the black flies and doing all that stuff. And uh, the other one, she said, you know, she lifted it until it hurt. And then she goes, I, I, I don't want to do that. And fast forward a few months, and she lost so much range of motion because she didn't push past that. Our faith is kind of that way. It's when we see the difficulties that we see God's faithfulness through it. It's during the hard times when I rely on him more. Because, probably to my shame, and maybe you're like me, but sometimes you pray more during the hard times than you do during the good times. Right? Because when I'm facing the hard times, I'm like, Lord, help me. Lord, I can't do this. And I, I rely on him so much more than when things are going good. It's like, hey, I can just cruise on down through, right? I don't have to worry about anything. And knowing that the struggles that we have in our life produce that endurance that we can have. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In our lives, God is working us towards maturity. And maturity really comes through that, working through that difficult times. And so many times I've talked to people who talk about being so close to the Lord during the hard times. Now, we don't like it. It's not enjoyable. But the end result is wonderful. So you've got to be careful. Be aware that this roller coaster, if you will, kind of takes effect. We have the good and we have the bad. Well, we turn around, we have Moses comes on through. He's just, things are going well. You know, he had the burning bush uh, scene. He comes down to Israel. He tells them, look, God's used me to deliver you guys. And they're worshiping and praising God. And Moses is like, hee this is great. Right according to plan. And then we get to chapter 5. And right off the bat, we have a problem. We have struggles that start taking place. And there's three areas that I want to talk about that we have these struggles. The first one is struggle from without. From the world around us, that we see the struggle that starts taking place, that starts affecting Moses, and then, of course, affects us as well. Look at Exodus chapter 5, just the first few verses here. We don't get far into this before trouble starts happening. It says, Afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. I just picture Charleston Heston. Let my people go. Right? He's been talking to the Israelites. They're all excited. We're getting out of here. He turns around and Moses comes before Pharaoh. And I picture he's just, he's all raring to go. And he turns around and says, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And right off the bat, I imagine Moses is going from here to here. This ain't working according to plan. Because I'm sure Moses thought he's going to walk in there and say, Hey, let, it, let, my, let Israel go. And Pharaoh will say, Okay. And then we the end of the story. But it's not. And Pharaoh turns around and says, well, I don't know this Lord of yours. And you know what? I ain't letting him go. What are you going to do about it? Right? The struggle starts coming, especially as Christians, when we deal with the unsaved, we deal with people who don't know the Lord, and, and they're often confused by what we do and what we say. Because the world thinks and does things differently. And there's times when we stand up and try to do what is right and try to encourage things that are right, and we see the world going just the opposite direction because they turn around and say, who is this God? And why should we obey him, right? We see that struggle that comes from the outside. Well, Moses kind of reiterates, well, 
the Lord, Jehovah. He, he's the guy who sent me. And then Pharaoh speaks back and says, Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you have made them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Right? So Moses has gone from, hey, we're, we're praising the Lord. I'm here to deliver my people. Pharaoh, let them go to, wait a minute, who's, who's this Lord? Why should I do that? Not only that, Pharaoh's like, you know what? You've been spending too much free time talking to these guys. Right? If the Israelites have so much free time, you know what? We can fix that. I remember my mom would always turn around and we would be out around the house, and we had five kids, four pretty active boys. And the worst thing we could ever tell my mom was we were bored. Right? We learned real quick, because I remember you know, one summer was going on, you know, mom's like, go out and play. And, uh, we're bored. She's like, I can fix this. And she had scrubbing floors and doing dishes, and I never told my mom I was bored again, because she found ways to keep us busy. And Pharaoh turns around and says, look, if you guys have this much time on your hand, you know what? Let them get their own straw. And what they would do is they make the bricks would take mud and clay and mix it together. And they use straw as a, as a binder that would strengthen it. And up to this point, Pharaoh was providing that. And he says, no, now you guys, you guys need to go find your own straw. The tensions start getting turned up. The struggle becomes very real in a very real way, right? It's oftentimes in our lives when we try to stand for our faith, try to stand for what is right, we start getting pressures from the outside. And sometimes by right, taking, you know, as mentioned this morning, pray for boldness for the church. Not just this church, but the, the church around the globe to take a stand. And it's amazing, the more of a stand we take, the more we are vocal about what we believe. Have you noticed how the pressure from the world has been turning up more and more? In here, we've seen cases and cases because of our faith that in here, the, the pressure has been to, you know what, you just need to suck it up and, and give in. You need to comply and go along with everyone else. And the world is pressuring us more and more. The struggle we have becomes more and more difficult. And we see this. Pharaoh goes on and says, hey, you, know, you guys have too much time on your hands. And, you know, and not only that, not only do you have to go get more straw, but now I still want the amount of work that you were doing before. We still want as many bricks. So the workload has increased, and of course, it's impossible for them to keep up. And the chapter goes on and talks about how they were abused and they were beat because they weren't making the numbers like they were supposed to. And the pressure starts coming in, and I think we feel this as, as churches that in here, the, the pressures of this world start squeezing us more and more to comply, and, and the more we're like, no, we can't. And so we have a, a problem. We can kind of shut up and kind of go along or we stand. And by standing, along comes it with the struggles. And we've seen this all throughout church history. But anyway, it shouldn't be something strange. Jesus tells us in, in John 15, he says, For the world hates you. You know that it hates, hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And you know, we start off this series with that song, This world is not my home, I'm just the passing through. That in here, I'm not of this world. I'm looking forward to heaven. And Christ is, is the king, and he's my king. And, and see, he's the one that I serve. He's the one I will worship. And in here, that brings us at odds with this world. 
in you. The world wants to make up its own definition of what is right and what is wrong. We've seen this change. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really not that old. I keep telling myself that. Don't laugh because I'm younger than a lot of you here, all right? Yeah, but I'm amazed, and maybe you've seen this, that even in my lifetime, the shift of things that used to be understood as wrong are now being told that it's right. Right? You guys, you see that, don't you? It's shifted. It's, it's changed. And the problem comes in is when we as Christians claim to be followers of the word and it doesn't change and I can't tell you how many times I've talked with people who said you know the church just needs to change to keep up with the times now things like music and style and all of those things those are all superficial things those things I, I have no problem with changing and adjusting to speak to the generation that's here but folks we cannot change the word of God it doesn't change the Bible defines what life is and when it begins. It defines marriage and, and what that's about. It tells parents of how to raise their children. It tells me as a husband what kind of husband I need to be. It tells me to guide and direct me in all my ways to acknowledge him and he'll direct my paths. But the world is getting further away from this. And is it any wonder it's at odds? And part of the problem is that not that the world is necessarily at odds with me, but it's in odds against the Lord. And that causes that struggle. Right? You know, we always can't live on the mountain. Everything isn't going to go well with us in this world. We're going to go through the struggles. And some of it is this world is not our home. The second thing we see is that we have the struggle from within, and not within ourselves. I'm going to bring that up in just a minute. But some of the struggle that takes place is by other Christians, by those who are other followers of the Lord. You know, I, I'm not surprised when the world acts like the world. I'm not surprised when the unsaved act like the unsaved. That doesn't shock me at all. Actually, it's probably to be expected. But the struggle comes in is when those who call themselves Christians, those who say they're followers of God, start compromising and start causing pressure on those who want to stand. We see this case here, right? So Pharaoh has turned around and said, you know what? You guys have too much time on your hand. You guys are getting together with Moses and talking, and you guys are talking about going out and trying to worship your God, which I don't even know, I don't even care about him, right? So I'm going to increase your workload. Well, you know how Israel liked that, right? You know, I, I, I find it funny how fickle the crowd can be because I'm sure as Moses was there and sharing and talking with them, they were excited, right? Moses is here to deliver us. All right, Moses, you're going to talk to Pharaoh. Oh, you go give him, right? You go talk to Pharaoh. So Moses goes in and comes back and says, Oh, uh, guys, you didn't go so well. Oh, yeah, what happened? He get, Pharaoh said he's not going to let us go. He said he doesn't know your God. Um, and also now you guys are going to have to work harder. And if you don't meet your quotas, he's going to beat you. What? Right? Now, so now the crowd is like, hey, wait a minute. This isn't what we signed up for. Right? Exodus goes on, verse 20 down to 23. It says, Then as they came out from Pharaoh, who met Moses and Aaron, who stood there to meet them, and they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hands to kill us. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to his people, neither have you delivered your people at all. The people aren't happy. Moses, what have you done? You made it worse for us. Right? You were supposed to make things better, but you made things worse. And Moses is feeling the heat. 
Moses is feeling the heat. And Moses turns around and, and goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what's going on? I thought I was supposed to deliver these guys. I thought things were going to get better. Remember, we were just praising the Lord just a few days ago, and, and now it's harder than it was before. And notice what he says at the very end of this. It says, neither have you delivered your people at all. Lord, all those things you promised, they're not happening. Moses is having this internal struggle with other believers. And Moses is feeling that pressure. And folks, as believers today, the worst pressure I think we feel is from other people who call themselves believers. We live, live in a day and age where so many people said, you know what, I believe in God, but I don't want anything to do with church. Right? I want to do my own thing. Don't you tell me what I should do or don't do, or they'll turn around and they'll use sort of this big thing and say, oh, well, don't you judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying what the Bible says. Well, I don't like that part. I have a conversation with someone. Well, I don't like that part of the Bible. We're talking about something. I said, well, the Bible says this. And they're like, well, I don't like that part. Okay. I didn't write it. It's not me. This is what God has said. But this is nothing new. Paul was sharing with a young man, Timothy, this young pastor. And he told them and warned them, and says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to say fables. The senior saint of Paul, who's been down the road a few times, warned Timothy, he goes, be careful, there's going to be a time when people who call themselves Christians are going to want their ears tickled. They want to hear things that they want to hear. I've shared with you guys before, uh, before I came here, I was applying for different, different churches. And there was one church that I got there application from, and right in the top of it was, we're looking for a pastor who will only preach affirming messages. And I was like, wow. We only want messages that make you feel good. Right? And there's a whole list of, of issues that we don't talk about. These are passages that we don't preach about in our church. Because we're afraid people are going to turn away. We just want our people to be encouraged. Well, wait, that's just half the story. Right? The Bible builds me up, encourages me, but also warns me. And in here, we got to be careful that we don't fall into the pressures of this world to compromise on the Word of God. But to believe what it says and to stand on it no matter what. Paul told the Corinthians this. He says, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And that, that one phrase there, handling of God, the handling the word of God deceitfully. Now, folks, you may not agree with everything that I say, and, and I know I'm not the world's best preacher, and, you know, I keep telling people, this is, Stockton Springs is a wonderful church. You're full of wonderful people. They just have a really weird pastor. I mean, he's the weak, I'm the weak link here. But at the end of the day, and people can say, you know, I don't like the way he dresses. I don't like the way he smells. I don't like the, you know, whatever it is you don't like about me. That, you know, Fine. But my desire at the end of the day that no one can ever say, Pastor, you didn't preach the Word of God. And Paul's like, we didn't handle the Word of God deceitfully. And we're living in a day and age where there's a lot of pulpits, a lot of people who are very dishonest with how they're interpreting the Scriptures. They want to condone sin. They want to condone what's going on. And so they pick and choose and twist 
to make it say what they want it to say. And the Bible says, pray for these ones because they have to give an account. I'm going to have to give an account to God for the words that I've given. And Paul's like, you know what? We deal with it deceitfully, but we kept true to the word of God. Lastly, I want to look at this morning that we have struggles from the outside, from the world. We have struggles from inside, from within the church or within fellow believers. The last one is the struggles in ourselves. They begin in the chapter 6, and, and, you know, we have Moses going to the Lord and says, Lord, what are you doing? Right? I, I, this isn't what I thought was going to happen. Years ago, I had a gentleman who called me up, and he was having some marital problems. And I asked him, I said, how are you, how's you in the Lord? And he goes, not that good. He goes, I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been praying. I haven't been going to church because I know my life isn't where it needs to be. And I think those ripples have affected my family, affected my marriage. I said, well, here, why don't you try to do what's right? And so he did. He, he jumped into a church, started to attend a church, reading his Bible every day. He was praying. And I call him up a few times. How you doing? He goes, oh, things are going better now. I feel better. I feel closer to the Lord. I said, good. Keep it up. Keep it up. About three months later, he called me up. He goes, you know what? I'm still having problems with my marriage. He goes, how long do I have to keep this up? I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, no. I, you know, I've been, I've been reading my Bible, and I've been going to church, and I, you know, I've been doing all this stuff. He goes, but my wife is still talking about leaving me. You know, he goes, how long do I have to keep this up? I said, that's a real bad way to looking at it. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, no, God wants a relationship with you that endures, that lasts. He goes, well, this is too much work. And he stopped reading his Bible, stopped praying, stopped going to church. And, he, and then he got mad at me because I didn't help him. I'm like, wait, 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 you know? And, and Moses is complaining that this isn't working like I thought it would. You know, he had those rose-colored glasses I warned you about, Right? All of a sudden, things aren't magically going to all get better. But what we have is the promise that God be with us, and he'll go through it with us, and, and God hears us. We have these promises. And in Exodus, um, I'm going to read the whole passage here, but it's amazing God's answer to Moses. And, and he turns around and reflects in here in, in 2 through 9, and basically he talks about who he is. Look, he says, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I also established my covenant. I heard the groaning. I, rem I have remembered my covenant. I will bring you out. I will rescue. I will redeem. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. The solution to the thing is not to focus on me, but realize who God is. I serve him because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I serve him because he loved me. He died for me to save me from my sins. The solution is keeping my eyes on Christ and who he is. I don't pray to him and I don't read the Bible and I don't go to church so that everything gets better. It's to bring me back into that relationship with who he is. And by seeking him first, then God starts putting the other things in my life. But God is not like a little magic rabbit foot that I put in my pocket for a while that makes everything all better. And we see this honesty in Moses, but Moses is like, <sighs> in verse 10 to 12, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in and tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of the land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel haven't heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me for of um, uncircumcised lips? Moses, Moses is like, you know, i kind of been there, done that. It didn't go so well. And he says, go in. He goes, look, God, I, I talked to your people, and they're not even willing to accept me. And he's like, you know, I told you I, I, I don't talk that well. Right? All the excuses Moses used before. That's what it means by uncircumcised lips. He goes, I don't talk too good. None too good. You know? You sent the wrong guy. Because when the pressure comes on, and especially if we expect things always to go better, and they don't always, 
Then we're like, okay, God, you made a mistake. And God explains his no, and it's interesting because in, in this chapter 6, he goes on and lists this genealogy of, of Moses and Aaron. And it seems sort of out of place. It seems odd. But at the end of it, he comes down to this is the very Moses. This is how it ends. If you read your Bibles here in chapter 6, there's this genealogy. I won't go through all that. But in here, it's that God has been following Moses. God didn't make a mistake by picking Moses, right? And he says, and you, these are the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. That, folks, God has been watching you. He's been keeping track of you. You are here this morning because I believe God wants you here. These words are here so that you can hear. God is in control. And God does not make mistakes. You are the one. Moses, you are the one. I've chosen you. I've kept track of you. I, I know all your family. I know where you're from. I know where you're going. You are the one, the same one. But things aren't working out well. God says, hey, I don't make mistakes. You're it. Keep on the path. Doing what I asked you to do. And things will work out for you. Can I tell you something, folks? It doesn't depend on us. What God wants of us is willingness. What God wants from us is surrender. Because it's not our abilities that God needs. God is more than able. God is powerful enough. He can do this with or without us. But he wants us to be involved in the process. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My grace is sufficient. Paul had asked for something to be taken away from his life. You ever prayed that? Lord, just make this go away. And Paul asked three times, and God said no. And he said, my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, I'm made strong. That folks, in our frailty, in our need, as we pour this out to God, that he is able to use us beyond what we can even imagine, not because of us, but because of him. He told the Philippians that this way, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's his strength. It's not by my gifts and my abilities. As I've said, I am probably the least talented person in this room. I can talk and I can eat. I have the, 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 I have the talents of a five-year-old. Right? You know, I can't build, I can't. I, there's a lot, I can't go through the whole list of things. And I say before you as a testimony, if, if God can use me, he can use you. Because I love this. I can do all things. It's through our weakness. He, if you are weak, God can use you if you'll let him. Think about that. In our weakness, he's made strong. You know what? How many of you guys have weakness? I, I have lots of weakness. That gives God great opportunity for him to use us. Do you see how that works? It's when I'm self-willed. It's when I think I can do it. I don't need God. It's when I go through all those things and I don't realize my need for him until I'm in the trials. Right? Count it all joy when you fall in the various trials because God will show us I can't do it. It's in the valley, it's in the bottom when I realize I can't do it on my own and I cry out to him and the power of God flows through me and he holds me and sustains me in all those things. In our weakness, if you're weak this morning, God can use you through his strength. That's a good place to be. Yeah, life, it can be a roller coaster. And it's easy to praise God when things are going well, but it's in the valleys we need to cry out. It's in the valleys when God shows his power and shows his might. Praise be to him. On heading home. 
as we turn towards him and ask him to do great things in our lives. Not because of me, but because of him. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you can use folks like me. The Lord, in our weakness, you are made strong. Lord, that you are God in the good times and you are God in the bad times. Lord, help me keep my eyes on you. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. As you play-